All right, guys, we're just going to get started, and then uh, whoever jumps on can jump on. So uh, today we're going to go over backflow. It's going to be a really basic 101, and then a, uh, then we're going to go uh, into some more troubleshooting. I'm hoping this can really help you guys out with uh, some of the calls that you may be getting or if you're out in the field and these guys are saying they're having some issues uh, with some of the Watts, Febco, or Ames device. Um, hopefully this helps you guys out a little bit. So first one we're going to go to is you know, what are my choices? Now, obviously there's a lot more than two, but I'm going to go with our first two big ones that are out there. Uh, these are going to be our ASSE 1013s, or you also hear them called RP, which is uh, a reduced pressure. Uh, our other one's going to be an ASSE 1015, which is going to be also our DC or our double check. So as you'll see right away here, uh, we'll start with our ASSE 1015. Uh, you'll notice this right here, this little sign. Uh, this is going to be for non-health hazard. A non-health hazard is anything that's going to enter your water that's not really going to hurt you. It may change the color or the taste or the odor of the water, but it's not going to make you sick. Um, over here at the 1013, you're going to have a health hazard. Now, what they're saying on this is there can be or could be something in the water that not just changes the taste, the odor, or the color, but could actually make you sick or potentially kill you. Uh, the other ones is when you get up to uh, more of like a, uh, I forget the name, but you know, you gotta get into air gaps. But these are gonna be more of your uh, two basic common backflows that are out there um, that you're gonna have, and guys are gonna have questions about it. Now, one of the big things I want to, especially you guys in the wholesaler business, uh, is do not make the decision for your plumbers. Make them tell you what they want. Uh, don't get in the habit of saying, oh, you should use this and try to get yourself uh, lined up for trouble uh, because they will come back to you. But if they ever make you make that choice, always go with an ASSE 1013 or an RP. They're the exact same thing, but it's going to cover all your bases. So we're going to start with our ASSE 1015. You'll notice that it is a non-health hazard. Uh, it is a double check and underline the DNC so you guys can see it. Uh, this device here will be more of our uh, 757. This will be our 007 and our 719. Uh, if you are working with watts, any of our 700 series is going to be our double checks or 1015. So how does it work? Uh, it's very simple. You're going to have check one, check two. Um, Basically, water's going to come through on your high pressure side, open that first check, allowing water in, open up the second check, and allowing water out. Now, guys, when you guys buy these brand new, this is going to come with a two-pound check and a two-pound check. They are interchangeable. Um, but as they get older, our minimum, and I'm going to talk a lot about minimum pressures, is going to be a one-pound. So you're going to come across here, lose one pound across this check as a minimum, and lose one pound across this check and have our minimum. But what you'll notice is there's no way to really tell if this thing ever would go bad. The only way to do that is to actually hook a test gauge up to all of your test cocks. Now, a lot of my problems with the double checks will only come during the initial install when debris uh, is entered from this area here and gets stuck on that first check or that second. Uh, the only other times we ever have problems with these is exactly one year later when you have to do a mandatory test, okay? So normally you'll have an issue right in the beginning where they've just got to clean the debris out of both checks uh, or one year later when they're forced to test it and they'll notice that the pressures are not holding. So I'd like to spend a little bit more time in, uh, with our ASSE 1013 or we call them our reduced pressure. Now one thing I want to tell you and I do get a lot of questions or, hey, I'm losing a lot of pressure across this device. Uh, we're, again, going to be talking minimum pressures, but I would always say if you're installing one of these uh, reduced pressure or these 1013s, you're going to have a minimum of a 12-pound loss across this device. Uh, if you don't have any pressure loss across it, technically this device won't work. And we'll get into that on how this works. So as you can see here, uh, we still have our check valve one, our check valve two. When it comes brand new to you guys and out in the field, this is technically going to be an eight pound spring and this will be a two pound spring. Okay? We can go over here, we'll see an eight pound spring and a two pound spring. 
So how these work, we have a high pressure zone, water will come in here. Before it opens here, it's gonna drop down through our sensing port and close our relief valve. After everything's settled in, uh, our check valve will open, allowing water into the intermediate zone. Once we're full here, we'll open up through our second check, allowing water downstream. Uh, we don't even have to get into Watts AIM FEP because this is gonna be every single uh, backflow out there that's a 1013 or an RP. I don't care if it's a Wilkins, an Apollo, a Watts, they all have to be designed this exact same way by law. Now you'll notice to the right over here, um, exact same thing, it just looks a little different. Check one, check two, here's our relief valve here, but instead of having a, a sensor port, on this one we have a sensor line allowing water to close off that, um, that port up there. So we're gonna go with pressure differential, okay? Uh, and now we're gonna talk minimum pressures because that's what these guys are gonna be talking about and running into. So how do these work? As you can see, we have 100 pounds coming into the device, okay? I have 100 pounds going through the sensor port, fill in this area right here, closing off your relief valve, okay? Once this is all settled, our number one check is gonna open and we're gonna have water come across. Now you'll notice that this right here is 95 pounds. Again, we have to have some sort of pressure drop across this uh, device or it won't work. Okay, so we're using that this is an older device, maybe 10 plus years old. Instead of the spring holding at eight pounds, we're getting our minimum five pound pressure loss across this check right here. Now we're at 95 pounds trying to open this relief valve. Well, obviously 100 is going to beat 95 all day long. So what we've done, because we've got to get a little closer, is now we've added a two pound spring right here. And that two pound spring is actually trying to open the device on you. So we have 95 plus our two pound spring. We're sitting right around 97 PSI trying to open it. But because we have 100 trying to close it, it's going to work great all the time. Again, minimums, we're gonna come across this spring here, losing one pound, water's going out. This is gonna work hands-on every time, you're not gonna have any issues. But most of the time, when you guys get the call or I get the call, it's not to say how well something's working, it's to kinda of tell you, hey, we have an issue. So we're gonna go through three of the common uh, problems that we run into, and hopefully you guys can understand it a little bit more. So we're gonna go with the first check failure, and this is gonna be caused by equalizing pressure. And I wanna explain this one here. So we have 100 pounds coming into our device, 100 pounds going through our uh, sensor port, closing off our relief valve. Now if you notice right here, we have a small piece of debris. And guys, that doesn't have to be like a large rock. It can be something as simple as sand uh, that gets stuck in there. Uh, and what happens is, as we equalize our pressures here and here, that water will actually start to seep across, increasing our pressures up to 100 PSI. But again, 100 pushing down, 100 closing off, we should not have any problems. But remember, we have that two pound spring trying to close it. So now, not only do we have 100 pounds here, but we have that additional two pounds, which brings us to 102 pounds. That's why this thing is opening up on you and dumping water, okay? Again, we'll go back through. We're gonna lose our one pound here. Brings us to that 94. Obviously, if it's 100, it may be up to 101, but most of the time, water's already dripping and or dumping out of this relief valve. Now, if you notice that bottom right corner, this is 90% of the times that I get calls on what's going wrong is we have dirt or debris all set up uh, in this first check, okay? Second check failure. Now, a second check can fail uh, at any point in time, and you're really not gonna have many issues because we're gonna come across here with our 100, we're gonna lose our five, we're at 95, and if this check fails a little bit here, normally it's not that big of a deal because the pressure is actually weeping downstream. Uh, but if you run into a back pressure issue, and back pressure is gonna be more um, if you have water expanding, um, or if you would have, um, say a solenoid valve that's shutting off very quickly, that water's running downstream 
hitting the solenoid valve, stopping, and then rushing back. Uh, that's where we're going to run into issues on this more back pressure where water's coming this way, coming back, equalizing out the pressure here, and dumping out the relief valve. Again, guys, this is 5% of the times. It's not very common, but it's out there. Now we have our relief valve failure, okay? Again, I have down here in the corner 5% of times. I'm really going to, I'd like to drop down that down to about maybe 1% of the times. Again, I'm going to move this up to about 95% of the times. It's our first check. Uh, I very rarely get debris in our relief valve. Most of the time it's because these guys have taken it apart and have just kind of pushed everything back together. There might be an O-ring out of place, uh, but we'll go with it as well. So we have 100 pounds entering the device, 100 pounds closing our relief valve, but if it's not closing all the way, our 100 pounds is going to weep through, fill in this intermediate zone to 100. Our two-pound spring is opening it. Now we're at 102, and it's going to dump out. Okay. Normally when they turn these on, water automatically goes in and dumps directly out because it's just not a good seal. So those are our three main. Our first check, equalizing the pressure. Our second check, uh, but based on back pressure. If you don't have back pressure, normally you will never have an issue. Uh, and then, again, we'll go to our relief valve, okay? So here's the big one. You guys get the calls. We get the calls. You want to troubleshoot this RP, uh, and the worst thing you want to do is tell them, hey, hold on, I don't know. So I'm going to give you three easy steps on how to troubleshoot this RP or 1013. Now, one thing I want to tell you here, we're going to go back up to these here. So, again, we talked about them only failing uh, in the beginning at the end. I've actually gone out and tested these, okay, got my minimum test pressures to actually pass the test, almost half knowing that a 2 by 4 could wedge in here five minutes later, allowing water to creep past and go downstream, but you'll never note it because you, don't, you have zero indication at the bottom, no relief valve showing that this has failed. That's why these are only good for low hazard uh, or something that's only going to taste the, uh, change the taste or the odor of that water. So our troubleshooting is really only going to be on our RPs or our 1013s because that's where you're getting uh, the calls that water is dumping out of that brand new device uh, that, you that you just sold them or it was installed. So step one, my relief valve's dripping, okay? First thing you want to do is open up test cock number four, which is going to be right here, or open up a downstream fixture. Now, what you're doing is you're actually running water through this device, okay? You're losing your pressure drop here. You're losing your pressure drop here, and it will stop, okay? If basically if the relief valve stops dripping or slows way down, I'm about a 99% sure you have a failed first check. If you turn the water back off and it starts dripping, you start having that pressure equalize between the high zone and your intermediate zone. Number two, the relief valve is still dripping. The step you want to take on this one is close off your number two shutoff valve, okay? So this is your number two shutoff valve, all right? If the water stops dripping out of that device, you know automatically that you have a failed second check and you have a back pressure issue, okay? Because now that we have closed off this valve here, no water can come back into the device and get past that second check and equal out your pressure in this intermediate zone. Number three, okay? Again, it's not going to happen very often, uh, but you, they call you, they say, man, it's still dripping. I can't figure this thing out. All right, if you've completed step one and two and there's no changes whatsoever, you can almost automatically point to, hey, you have a relief valve issue. Either um, there's debris in it, there's an O-ring out of place, uh, but those are going to be your basic three steps. Uh, everybody on this email right now, I'm going to uh, send out a startup slash uh, troubleshooting sheet right, where you guys can actually read that all the way through. Um, and a startup is a major problem 
with what I'm finding out in the field. Guys love to hook a line up here, hook a line up here, open a valve, open a valve, and say, hey, man, it is working awesome. But you got to remember, there's a lot of things going on in this area uh, that can enter this device. So I'll give you a startup. Uh, not that you guys should have to memorize any of this stuff, but it's definitely something you can walk through with your guys on a startup process, and I've written it out in a very easy way. It's not complicated. Step one, two, three, and four. Uh, and then below it, you'll have this troubleshooting guide uh, all typed out for you guys so you're able to talk to uh, anybody in the field. So on my conclusion, this one here, okay, a backflow device, especially our RP and our 1013s, they're, they are designed to fail, okay? They are a safety device, okay? So if there's a problem in this device, if something's not right, we want it to fail and we want it to dump out that relief valve or at least show on a test that something's not working so guys can get in there and actually put it together or rebuild them, okay? These have to work 100%. If it's 99%, they're gonna fail the test. My second point here is a proper startup. Uh, the proper startup of these devices uh, it's kind of like jumping into a car uh, and just turning the key and doing nothing else. Sometimes you actually have to put gas in it. You may have to check a few things. You can't just turn the key, jam on the gas, and take off. Uh, the proper startup of these devices can also take a lot of problems out. Lastly is adding a strainer upstream. That means before the device itself is going to solve 99% of all the problems, okay? Because any debris, sand, rock, tools, I don't care what it is, that strainer is going to stop it before it gets in the device. And it's a lot easier to blow down one of our strainers here than to take this entire device apart, okay? So uh, always try to push to, hey, you can add a strainer. It's, I know it's a couple extra bucks, but it's really going to help out in the long run. Now, you'll see right here, please exclude fire suppression systems. You cannot add any uh, strainers in front of a fire suppression backflow. The reason is, is if this would get completely clogged up with sand, obviously no water's gonna make it to the backflow, which means when there's a fire, you can't get the water to dump out, okay? So on the fire suppression, guys, um, I literally work with them one-on-one -on, -one on how to properly blow down all of their lines to make sure that everything is put together. So, Guys, I know most of you guys have actually been here before. Uh, if you haven't, this is a full invitation uh, for you guys. Uh, we have our classroom where we go over this stuff a little bit more in depth, and I know people feel a little bit more comfortable raising their hand and asking questions. Uh, we also have our wet lab where you guys can actually physically work on some of these devices where I'll actually make them dump, and then I'll let you go in and try to fix them. Uh, we do this for fun. Uh, this isn't like a graded classroom.